Hey guys, thanks for joining us on Family Life Today here on YouTube. YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. You don't want to miss any episodes, so hit the little bell and you'll get notifications and you won't miss anything. And if this encourages you, like it and, and share, share it with it. your friends. Yeah, share it with your friends. Yeah, welcome to Family Life Today. Pastors perform weddings. It's God that does the marriage. Pastors don't join a couple together. God joins together. Holding a marriage together is not just saying, I'll be loyal to you like you're loyal to each other. No, you're loyal to two things. The vows that you took before God and the God that you took the vows before. That's what you're loyal to. The loyalty to each other is a fruit of that. It's a result of that. A lot of couples that get married, sometimes it concerns me. They don't understand. You're not just saying words. You are taking, I, that's why I do my wedding. You're taking a sacred vow before God. Till death do you part. We don't take that seriously much anymore. Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Ann Wilson. And I'm Dave Wilson. And you can find us at FamilyLifeToday.com or on our Family Life app. This is Family Life Today. So, you know, there's a TV show that Every once in a while, I'll be flipping around channels. And when I get there, I sort of stop. Oh, yes. I totally know what you're going to say. NFL football. No. College no, football. That I would expect. <laughs> but when I come into the room and I'll say like, no, wait, I don't, I don't wait, even, I don't even want anybody to know this. The Bachelor? <laughs> I have never watched The Bachelor, but I've watched you totally minutes have. of it. Well, I haven't watched the season. Oh, no. I can't even tell you a name of a Bachelor or Bachelorette. Yeah. I don't know. But, but you I'll, get kind of mesmerized I'll by it. I'll be sitting it. there on the couch. I'm flipping around and, you know, oh, the, there's The Bachelor. And I get mesmerized because it's so comical. It's like, are you kidding me? Sorry for this offending woman, our Bachelor I'm fans. sure there's people that love it. I know they have Bachelor and Bachelorette parties, whatever. All I know is I'm smiling, snickering, because, like, you really think you're going to pick a future spouse based on how they look, how they date in these exotic places, right? Yes. And I used to watch it when our boys had their friends, their girlfriends over. And it's terrible because they'd say, you guys, just leave the room. You're wrecking the show for us. Because we would say things like, okay, this isn't realistic or this is a terrible plan. They're like, you guys, you're wrecking it. Just leave. Because the reason is, if I would ask you, okay, if you're going to counsel or coach a single person on how to pick a future marriage spouse, what would you say number one thing they should be looking for? Character. Yeah. And in That's the show, why they're looking at just the outward. Yeah, we know that. They're looking at image and uh, you name it, but character matters. And we've got James uh, Merritt back with us in the studio today. He is a man of character, wrote a book on character, lives a life of character. James, welcome back. Good to be back with you. Just really enjoyed being here. Yeah, and your book, Character Still Counts. And, and by the way, many people know you as uh, author, pastor. I didn't know 15 books. That's, that's pretty crazy mm. that you've written that. You have a TV show. Well, God's been good. Yeah, I mean, God's he's done so many things in your life. Uh, former president of Southern Baptist Convention. But probably most important, you're a husband, a dad, and a grandfather, yes, and sir. that's all about character. Yes, sir. It really is. It's you know, the older you get, the more you do realize that. That you know, and again, as we were talking about it earlier, it is so important. I, when I hire staff, when we hire staff, I've done this ever since I've pastored. I tell our staff, I said, look, I want you to have three priorities in this order. Number one is your relationship to God. Number two, your relationship to your family, and then I always put it this way: and a distant third is your relationship to the church. Mm. I said because if you're not what you ought to be with God privately. And if you're not what you ought to be with God and your family in your home, you won't be what I need as a minister. I don't care how good you are at what you do. You will not be what I need you to be. Mm. You know, we've all seen it. I've seen a lot of pastors shipwreck their ministry yeah. because they made the ministry their marriage. And they made the ministry their wife. And, their, and they made the ministry their children. And, you know, your, your first calling is going to be as a dad and as a husband. And if it doesn't work at home, it's not going to work in the church. 
which as you know, as even the scripture talks about, if you're going to be a pastor, you've got to be able to rule your own household well. Right, right. Why did Paul say that? Because you know what I'm talking about. You've got to get it done at home. If you're a Christian and it doesn't work at home, don't export it. And I can remember talking to our boys like, this is what matters, character. Kids are like, I don't even know what that means. What, what What's character mean? And, and you really have walked us through so many of these things that matter. But we're living in this culture. I think parents listening are like, help me with this. Because my kids, all they care about is image. They care about the likes. They care about how many that are watching their YouTube page. And so as parents, how would you guide them to say, okay, focus on character instead of reputation or image? What's your encouragement to them? It's a great question. And and let me just say before I, I give my answer to all the parents that are out there and having been one. I think the job of parenting today is more difficult than it's ever been in the history of our country. When I was, my boys growing up, I'm sure you guys the same way, social media, the the phrase didn't even exist. So it was a simpler world, you know, in some ways than it is. You know, there are people today, Twitter's their God. Hmm. Instagram's their God. Their greatest claim to fame is, but I have a million followers, or I have 20 million followers, or, 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 you know, or whatever. So having said that, I want to just say before I say anything to you moms and dads out there, God bless every one of you. It's difficult. Now, the good news is it's not impossible. It is still possible to raise godly children. I think, obviously, the first thing you have to do, character really is, in a sense, more caught than it is taught. And the most important thing, and I know you guys did it, but the most important thing a parent can do is make sure their kids see that their words match their lives, that they don't see one mom and dad on Sunday morning Another mom, another mom and dad on Monday morning. Not that we're perfect. If my three boys are here today, they'd be more than happy to tell you all the <laughs> flaws I had and all the faults I had as a dad, and I'd be the first one to, to own up to them. But as a whole, all three of my boys would also say, my dad lived what he preached. My dad practiced what he preached. And, in fact, Adrian used to say it. Dr. Raj used to say it this way. He said, James, I don't want to so much practice what I preach. I want to preach what I practice. Mm. And that's kind of been my philosophy. Having said that, I think the first thing you've got to do is model it. You've got to model character in your home. If you want your kids to read their Bible, you better they they better know you read yours. If you want your kids to all you know be constantly talking to the Lord, they ought to know that you constantly talk to the Lord. We've got to, as parents, not just model it, but we've got to begin to inculcate in our children a biblical worldview. That's the biggest thing missing in the church. The average Christian doesn't think biblically. They think kind of like everybody else thinks. But when you are steeped in the Word of God and you study the Word of God and you live it, then you have this biblical worldview. So you you would model it. Second thing is every day teach it. And here's what I was going to say. There are these negative moments. You're going to get them every day where it's a teachable moment. For example, I told my grandson, Harper, we was talking about it not long ago, I am amazed at who will get standing ovations today you know, a rock star or, you know, Hollywood star or this or that or the other. It doesn't matter if they live a life of an alley cat. You know, people, I mean, oh, yeah, but this is him and he's cool and he makes this kind of money. You know, look how he dresses, look all the gold he wears around his neck. And I'm trying to teach my grandchildren now that forget his reputation or her reputation. What is their character? I have a saying on my desk. I think I put this in the book by Dwight L. Moody. It's on my desk in my office. If you will take care of your character, God will take care of your reputation. Young people today more than ever need to hear that. And that said, it's easy to, to feel guilty because we all fail. Um, no matter how hard you try, I guess your boys are like mine, but they haven't always <laughs> done exactly what I would have done. And you have to let them make mistakes. But at the same time, you know, when you can look back and say, you know, Lord, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I made mistakes and I understand that, but I really did the best I could to teach them in the way they should go so that when they get old, they won't depart from it. I've done the best I know how to do, and now you turn them over to, I turn them over to you. That's really all you can do. But the first institution God created was the home. It wasn't the church, it wasn't the government, it was the home. God made a clear big statement when he, you know, when he did that. And it's really interesting, as you think about marriage and family, it really is about character. I mean, everything is, and that's what you say in your book, character still counts. It counts everywhere. But think about this. I remember when I was a young pastor 30-some years ago, I remember thinking, man, in some professions, character doesn't seem to be as important as it would be in ministry. It's like it's a character profession. Then you know what hit me? Being a husband is a character profession. Being a dad is a character profession. It's all about that. So talk about 
like one of your character traits that you talk about in the book is loyalty. Talk about loyalty in a marriage. Loyalty in a marriage to me is not just being loyal to the person. It's being loyal to the vows. You're talking about watching The Bachelor. I've never seen The Bachelor myself either. But, but it You're is, a better man than me. No. That's what you I, are. I, I'm not going to say I may have watched five minutes of the show, but I know enough about the show. It is funny. It's yeah. hilarious. It is the exact opposite way you ought to go find somebody. First right. of all, that's not the way you ought to do it. And we, and it, as you know, it doesn't play out most of the time nope. anyway. But, I, but I'll give you, if I can give a personal illustration, I'm married today to the woman I married because of, of the Lord being in my life. My wife was the kind of girl that I, when I was in high school, I thought would never date me. I didn't play quarterback like you did. And, and my wife was a cheerleader in high school. She was a cheerleader in college. She was a beauty contest winner. And she is, to me to this day, still the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. But she was the kind of girl I would say, I, I look at her and I'd say, I wouldn't have a chance with that girl. So long story short, she had just come out of a relationship with a guy who played football. I've seen his picture. He looked like a 6'3", 220 Brad Pitt. I mean, the guy was just, you know, but he was an atheist, didn't believe in God. Mm. And she knew that was not good for her. But, you know, but they were going together and all. I mean, they were living pure, but they were going together. I meet her at Truett McConnell College. I was doing a youth camp. I was a student pastor. And I met her. And again, I was so shy, I, I just couldn't even bring myself to talk to her. Well, one of my students in the youth ministry, without letting me know, he goes down to check her out, says she's going with anybody. I didn't know it. And he comes back and says, hey, man, she's free. And I said, you know, I just talked to her. I said, oh, Lord. So I ran down there. Look, I had nothing to do with it. Please don't. I didn't know he was going to do it. But it, it, by the way, would you like to go out after Bible study tonight? <laughs> so we went out that night, went to get an ice Mr. cream. Mr. Shy Boy didn't have too much shyness. I, I'm right telling then. you, man, I was smitten when she <laughs> turned around and stood up to help me. The first time I laid eyes on her, I was, you know, like, I was done. So took her out that night, and we just sat and talked. She went The next night, I went to her home and picked her up, proposed to her that night. What? Second, Second date, date? Proposed to Come her that on. night. I did. And uh, it took her, she, she dated one guy, well, I didn't, she met him that following Friday, dated him two weeks every night trying to forget me. God wouldn't let her do it. She came down to see me unexpectedly with the church where I was, just to see me for an hour, left, called me, she got back home, told me she loved me, she wanted to marry me. So we were married five months later, we been married 45 years. But what she'll tell you is this, she said, you are unlike any other guy I ever dated. The first thing I wanted to find out about her, Dave, do you know Christ? That's the first thing I wanted to ask her. I don't care how beautiful she was. If you don't know the Lord, we, we got, we're having an issue. Yeah. And so she will tell you to this day, the reason that, that I got her, thank God, was not because of me. It was because of the Christ that lives in me. I'm a living testimony that the happiest marriages are where two people both love Jesus. Here, here, let me tell you the husband and the wife that love each other the most. The wife that loves Jesus more than she loves her husband loves her husband the most. And the husband that loves Jesus more than he loves his wife, loves his wife the most. And if they both love Jesus the most, nobody, nobody that's an unbeliever can really say deep down they've got that kind of love for each other because it takes it to another dimension. It takes yeah. another love. Same thing's true about parents and kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you love God, you love your kids in a way that an unbeliever, I'm not saying unbelievers don't love their kids. That's not my point. But you have to, you have to be a believer to understand what I'm saying. It's a new level. When you love your kids, not just as your blood and, you know, and, and your kin kids, but you love them as your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a brand. It's a different level. Yeah, I know that. And I'm sure, James, you've experienced the same thing as a pastor doing the wedding. Yeah. You're looking at this groom and this bride. And I know this when I know them well enough to know this guy is thinking this. This is not he's looking at his bride thinking she's not the most important person in my life. And she's thinking the same thing. And, you know, most weddings, you know, they're not thinking that. They're thinking, oh, I'm marrying you because you're the most important person in my life. I'm marrying him because, and that's wonderful. And, and you they're going to the, make me happy. You want to feel you want to feel that on your wedding day. But when the groom and the bride know, no, 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 she's not the most important person Jesus is. He's not the most important person Jesus is. Then, you know, this marriage can go the distance because if Jesus is number one, character is what I'm going to be because I'm accountable to God, not just my spouse, but to God. And that's going to transform a marriage. Talk about this though. As a dad, you've raised sons and now grandkids. What if you've blown it? What if you're a man or a woman that's made some character 
decisions that were bad. Mm-hmm. You've sinned in ways that you never thought you would, but you're, you feel like I'm not really a man or woman of integrity because my life isn't matching. How do you recover? First of all, you have to display true repentance. Mm-hmm. That's where we don't use much anymore. We don't yeah. hear it much. Anymore. So the first word Jesus ever spoke in his first sermon he ever preached was repent. repent. But we don't hear that much anymore. But I think the first thing you have to do is repent and show the fruits of repentance. Full confession here. I didn't always have the patience with my boys that I should have had growing up. And um, I had a temper. And uh, about five, maybe six Christmas Eves ago, we were, we were over the house and we were getting bringing presents upstairs. And I just felt led to do this. So I called all the guys downstairs. I said, guys, I got to tell you something. And they said, okay, I just, I just, I lost it. I just broke, I just started weeping. And I said, guys, I was too hard on you. And there were times I lost my temper with you. And I'm just telling you, it was wrong. I was wrong. I, I just ask you to forgive me. And of course, they, you know, they all come, oh, no, no. I said, no, 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 guys, you know I'm telling the truth. Let's don't sugarcoat this. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I wish I could have that to do over again. And I said, I hate to tell you this, but I am because I'm doing it with my grandkids. And I've never lost my temper with my grandkids, mm-hmm. which kind of irritates them sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, my point is the best thing you can do with your family, and it's hard, is just go and admit what you've done. Whatever it is, just say, look, I blew it. We're not going to sugarcoat this. I have repented. And I told the boys this. I've repented. I cannot do it over again, but I can do from this point on, I can do all I can to show you I can, you know, be the man in that area of my life that I ought to be, and, and, I, and I am. So I think, you, you know, you have to humble yourself. You have to confess it. You have to admit it. And then you have to repent. And then you even have to say, hold me accountable. Watch me. And if you see me sliding in any way in this area of my life, you owe it to me as my sons or my wife, or whatever, to tell me to do that. The problem is, it's, it's so weird Pride is bigger in our home sometimes mm. than it is anywhere else. You know, for example, if if you did something wrong in your job, and you love your job, and you know if I don't make this right, I'm gonna get fired. It's amazing how humble you can get with your boss, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Well, we ought to be even more humble with our wives, and with our children, and our family. And when we've blown it. Go to them. Your stature will grow. Their respect for you will grow. Their love for you will grow. You don't lose. You win when you do that. Well, I like, I think that really pairs with another character quality is perseverance. Like, and if they're hard on you, or if you feel like I've done this a million times, or I've, I've tried to talk to my son or my daughter a million times, or my husband or wife, so often we just give up, like, it doesn't work. I'm not going to keep going. But perseverance, you've talked about this, like, this is key. And I thought it was interesting, too, because you talk about Apple and the founders yeah. of Apple. Talk about that a little bit. I bet a lot of people don't know this story of the founders. Yeah, there were three guys, and one of them, frankly— Yeah, it's funny you don't know his name. Yeah, I don't know his name. Because he— He gave up. He gave up too early and sold his stock for, like, peanuts. $800. $800, that's right. And I I think—I can't remember what it said, but I think I put in the book what it would be worth. $60 billion. $60 billion. Because, you know, he gave up. And by the way, I'm glad you brought that up, Ann. One of the biggest— things I see that breaks my heart in marriage so often is people do give up too soon yeah. and people do give up too quickly. And I'll tell you why, you know, let me tell you why we quit. And this is hard for people to admit. If you're a believer and you quit, you're not quitting on the situation. You're not quitting on the person. You're quitting on God because you're, what right. you're really saying when you quit is, you know what? Even you can't handle this. E- even you can't do this. I had a couple that came in to see me It is the worst situation I have ever encountered in my ministry, ever. This couple came in to see me. This is how bad it was. They had lived apart, and the only reason they did not divorce, they financially just could not afford it. That's the only reason they didn't. That's the only reason. She would write her husband, get a birthday card. She would cross out the I love and happy birthday, and she would say things, you know, I hope today's a day in hell for you. I hate you with everything. I mean, she she would do it and put it under his door. It was toxic. It was so poison. So I looked at him, and I, I started with him, and I said, and he really wanted the marriage to work. And I said, do you, are you willing to do whatever it takes to, for this marriage to work? And uh, he said, Pastor, I am. And I looked at her, and she said, not sure. I said, I can't help you. If you don't want it to work, I promise you it's not going to work. Okay, If you don't want it to work, it's not going to work. And so I told him that. So I'll be honest with you. I, didn't, I wouldn't have given them a nickel yeah. for that thing to work. 
they came back about eight months later. They're glowing. They're happy, and they're coming in, and, and they're sitting down. And they said, uh, "We was I, I thought they was coming in for another session because I told them I said I can't. You need to go to a professional. I can't help you." So they came in, Dave, and they sat down. And I'm thinking, boy, this is what, okay. They they must have gotten a divorce, and now they're just so happy. They got. I can't even go into the details of it, but God just got in there. Hmm. God got in there, and what they'll tell you today, they now give their testimony. What they'll tell you today is. They're so glad. Now, they were forced to hang in there because of their finances, but it was God's way of not letting them quit. And they're so and they're the happiest couple I know of anywhere in the world now because they just they did not quit. Mm. And that's character. Yeah. I mean, you list 12 different uh, you know attributes of character, and that's a big one. You don't make it to the finish line if you don't have character because you quit. Yeah. It's too easy, and whether it's marriage, job, your faith. And I would just add this one last thought is character is developed in community. Yep. Like Pretty men, right. you need men in your life to look you in the eye when you aren't exhibiting character and call you. Women need women. We need couples in our lives. You don't develop it in, in, in the dark. You don't develop it in isolation. You need a community, right? Dave, you are, you play quarterback, right? You play football. You I was it. amazing, James. You I, know, I, I can tell. The older you. I get, the better I was. There's no, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. And your, your humility blows me away. <laughs> but anyway, you developed your character on a football field, practicing with your players, right. practicing with those guys, taking the hits, right. letting them show that you know I can lead this football team. You could have gone out with your receivers and just kind of thrown back forth all day long. That would develop character. Okay, right. that's why the real character development is on Saturday in the college and Sunday in the NFL. That's when you know what kind of character you got, yeah. right? Football, all sports are, are great that way. The other thing to make uh, come back full circle, you talked about loyalty. This is a thing that, that, again, a lot of couples don't realize anymore. Pastors perform weddings. It's God that does the marriage. Yeah. Pastors don't join a couple together. God joins together. Holding a marriage together is not just saying, I'll be loyal to you like you're loyal to each other. No, you're loyal to two things. The vows that you took before God and the God that you took the vows before. Yeah. That's what you're loyal to. The loyalty to each other is a fruit of that. It's a result of that. A lot of couples that get married, sometimes it concerns me. They don't understand. You're not just saying words. You are taking, I, that's the way I do my wedding. You're taking a sacred vow before God till death do you part. We don't take that seriously much anymore. Yeah. And I tell you what, the only way that vow is lived out is the power of God in us. Yes. The power of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit literally to make us men and women of character. And that's where it starts and it ends. It yeah. starts and ends with Jesus. That's right. No question. James, thanks. It's been great stuff. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Most of the time when we hear the word loyal, we think, oh, I'm loyal to this person, or I'm loyal to this team, or I'm, I'm loyal to this area. But as David Ann Wilson had been talking with James Merritt, he's helped us to see that when it comes to marriage, loyalty isn't necessarily to your spouse. It's a different kind of loyalty that makes it more about God vertically as opposed to the other person and us horizontally. James Merritt has written a book called Character Still Counts. It is time to restore our lasting values. You can order a copy in our Family Life Resource Center by logging on to familylifetoday.com, or you can pick up the phone and give us a call at 1-800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today to request your copy of Character Still Counts by James Merritt. And when it comes to character, we as fathers sometimes have a lot of trouble instilling character in our sons as we think about raising them in this culture, in this environment today. John Tyson, our guest coming up tomorrow, has written a book called The Intentional Father about how to raise your sons in a culture that pushes them in a direction that's away from God. This book is going to be our gift to you for a donation of any amount. If you log on to familylifetoday.com and make a donation to the Ministry of Family Life or call 1-800-358-6329, 
It's our gift to you as a way to say thank you for extending the ministry of what we do here at Family Life. And like I said, David and Wilson are going to be talking with John Tyson tomorrow, the author of The Intentional Father. If this content today or any of the Family Life programs have been helpful for you, we'd love for you to share today's podcast with a friend or a family member. And while you're there, it could really help us advance the ministry of what we're doing at Family Life if you'd scroll down and rate and review us. On behalf of David Ann Wilson, I'm Shelby Abbott. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life, a crew ministry, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.